Medical knowledge has advanced significantly over the years, though there are still many questions that we don't have answers to. Today's video focuses on three different medical mysteries. Sorry that my voice sounds off, I've been ill for the last few days, so I'm hoping I can make it through the video without it going completely. If you generally enjoy mysteries, true crime, disappearances and the occasional conspiracy, please feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. Encephalitis is inflammation of the brain which can cause symptoms such as headaches, fever and vomiting. An atypical form of the condition, encephalitis lethargica, was first described by Konstantin von Economo in 1917. The disease, also known as sleeping sickness, is characterised by high fever, sore throat, headache, lethargy, double vision, delayed physical and mental response, sleep inversion and catatonia. While some experience sleepiness, others experience wakefulness. I'm going to refer to it as EL going forward as I keep forgetting the pronunciation. Reports vary greatly on the number of cases, but a reasonable estimate seems to be around 1 million cases between 1915 and 1926. Again, reports vary, but it seems that men were more susceptible and most people who were affected were aged younger than 40. Of those affected, around a third died in the acute stages, and many of those who survived the disease never returned to normal. The severity of the symptoms varied. Some people would fall asleep while walking or doing some other activity, and others would be conscious and aware but completely unable to move or speak. Some even recovered and lived normal lives for a few years, until they later developed symptoms similar to that of Parkinson's disease. If they were able to move at all, they'd sometimes just stop in the middle of what they were doing and be unable to continue with the activity. Most people who experienced this were eventually left catatonic or immobile and were left to live out their days in hospitals or psychiatric institutions as there was no cure for the disease. That was until the late 1960s when Oliver Sacks, a neurologist, decided to try treating patients with a new drug called L-Dopa. Miraculously, when given the drug, most of the patients woke up from their coma-like states and returned to health. They were able to describe their experiences, with some saying they weren't really aware of what happened and that time had passed, and others able to recall events that had happened while they were unresponsive, showing that they'd been conscious throughout. Which is pretty terrifying, to be honest. I mean, imagine being conscious but unable to move. I mean, you'd be pretty much trapped in your own body, but aware of everything that was happening. Sadly though, within weeks and even days for some patients, they began experiencing serious side effects including hallucinations and aggressive behaviour, and over time it seemed that the drug became less effective at treating the disease. Despite Sack's attempts to find the perfect dosage, few were able to continue treatment beyond a couple of months, and when they stopped taking the drug, they returned to the same state that they'd been in prior to treatment, with some even deteriorating. Aside from lack of a cure or a safe, effective treatment, it was a mystery in itself what exactly caused this disease. Because the 1918 influenza epidemic, also known as the Spanish flu, occurred at around the same time, some experts believe that the two were linked and that EL was either a acute viral or post-viral syndrome. It was also suggested that a virus linked to the polio virus might have caused EL, though this has been disputed by many experts. More recent research suggests a link between EL and streptococcal infection. It's also a mystery exactly how EL is transmitted. Outbreaks in certain areas and inside homes led some people to believe that it was contagious, though there are just as many anecdotal stories to suggest otherwise, such as one member of a household having EL and no one else catching it. It's generally believed that EL was not contagious, though it has been suggested that there might have been different strains of it, with some being highly contagious and others less so. While it seems that this epidemic started in 1915, the reports of EL are at least diseases with very similar symptoms, dating as far back as 1580. It's extremely rare, but sporadic cases of EL have even been reported more recently, though sadly there's still no cure or effective treatment. I think many of you may have heard of Gloria Ramirez, or the Toxic Lady, but this is one of those cases that I just never get bored of hearing about, and if you haven't heard of it, prepare to be baffled. Gloria was suffering from late-stage cervical cancer when she was admitted to the emergency department of Riverside Hospital 
in California in 1994. She was suffering from severe heart palpitations and was extremely confused, so was sedated when she arrived at the hospital. She was not responding to treatment, so staff used the defibrillator, at which point they noticed that Gloria's body seemed to be covered in an oily sheen. Some noted that her breath smelled of fruity garlic, and a nurse who took a blood sample stated that the blood smelled of ammonia. The nurse showed the blood sample to another colleague who noticed manila coloured particles floating in the blood. The nurse stated that her face was burning when she fainted shortly after. Her colleague also said that they felt sick so they had to leave the room as well. A staff member asked if she was okay but she fainted before she could answer. Another member of staff who had been assisting in the room fainted as well. In total, 23 of the 37 hospital staff became ill, with 5 being hospitalised. One woman had to stay in intensive care for a few different problems including hepatitis, pancreatitis and a vascular necrosis, where blood flow to the bone tissue was reduced, causing it to die. She was on crutches for months after that happened. The official cause of death was determined to be cardiac dysrhythmia caused by kidney failure as a result of her cervical cancer. Though this is disputed and the symptoms experienced by the hospital staff still remains a mystery to this day. Debatably the most popular theory is that all the staff were experiencing mass hysteria. This is supported by the fact that there were no poisons found in Gloria's body and that the hospital staff who drove Gloria to the hospital didn't experience any symptoms. It's suggested that the hysteria could have been triggered by the strange fruity garlic smell. It's probably the most believable theory just because there's no way to disprove it short of ruling out every single other theory that there possibly could be which would be impractical and probably impossible. That said, I don't even know if some of the symptoms experienced by the staff could even be caused by mass hysteria. I mean, it makes sense for the vomiting and the fainting, but the woman who experienced hepatitis, pancreatitis and a vascular necrosis, would that even be possible as a result of mass hysteria? Another theory is that Gloria used a DMSO gel to help ease the symptoms of her cancer which would have explained the garlic smell and the oily sheen on her body. A compound, dimethyl sulfone, was found in excess in the autopsy samples and this is very similar to the chemical structure of DMSO. When oxygen is added to the compound, crystals form, which could explain the particles seen floating in the blood sample. It was theorised that the defibrillator could have caused the dimethyl sulfone to break down in Gloria's body and if that combined with sulphur in the body, it could form dimethyl sulfate, a poisonous chemical that can cause symptoms similar to those experienced by the hospital staff, though not the nausea and vomiting, which was the most common. So you might think case closed, though this theory was never tested, no simulations were ever performed, and many scientists argue that this would be completely impossible. Gloria's family believe that her death was caused by the conditions at the hospital, and this could possibly be supported by a couple of incidents that happened prior to Gloria's death. Three years prior, two hospital staff had to receive treatment after being exposed to poisonous gas that had leaked from a steriliser. One year prior to Gloria's death, an inspection revealed that sewer gas was present in the emergency room. Gloria's family attempted to get an independent autopsy done, though this couldn't be performed due to the fact that Gloria's heart was missing, her other organs were contaminated with faecal matter, and her body was so decomposed that it'd be impossible. This suggested that the body was potentially stored in incorrect conditions at the previous facility. Another theory, still on the note of the hospital being responsible in some way, relates to Riverside County being a large distributor of methamphetamine at the time. Nicotinamide was one of the strange compounds that was found in Gloria's body, and as it happens, this is also a drug that's commonly mixed with methamphetamine. So the theory suggests that the chemicals used to make meth were smuggled into the hospital via IV bags and that Gloria was accidentally given one of those bags, which ended up causing her death. This would explain the ammonia smell of her blood and also some of the symptoms experienced by hospital staff which are similar to those of meth fume exposure. Though no proof of this theory was ever found, no secret meth lab or anything like that, so while the theory would answer some of the questions we have it does seem pretty unlikely overall. So this last one has got a little bit of mystery mixed in with it, but if anything it's just a really fascinating thing that I wanted to talk about. Rabies is an absolutely terrifying disease. If you're not fully aware of what it is, I'll read this reddit comment which explains it really well. 
Let me paint you a picture. You go camping and at midday you decide to take a nap in a nice little hammock. While sleeping, a tiny brown bat in the rage stages of infection is fidgeting in broad daylight, uncomfortable and thirsty due to hydrophobia, and you snort, startling him. He goes into attack mode. Except you're asleep, and he's a little brown bat, so weighs around 6 grams. You don't even feel him land on your bare knees and he starts to bite. His teeth are tiny, hardly enough to even break the skin, but he does manage to give you the equivalent of a tiny scrape that goes completely unnoticed. Rabies does not travel in your blood, in fact a blood test won't even tell you if you've got it. Antibody tests may be done, but are useless if you've ever been vaccinated. You wake up, none the wiser. If you notice anything at the bite site at all, you assume you just lightly scraped it on something. The bomb has been lit, and your nervous system is the wick. The rabies will multiply along your nervous system, doing virtually no damage and completely undetectable. You literally have no symptoms. It may be four days, it may be a year, but the camping trip is most likely long forgotten. Then one day your back starts to ache, or maybe you get a slight headache. At this point, you're already dead, there is no cure. The sole caveat to this is the Milwaukee Protocol, which leaves most patients dead anyway, and the survivor's mentally disabled and is seldom done. There's no treatment, it has a 100% kill rate, absorb that. Not a single other virus on the planet has a 100% kill rate, only rabies. And once you're symptomatic, it's over. You're dead. So what does that look like? Your headache turns into a fever and a general feeling of being unwell. You're fidgety, uncomfortable and scared. As the virus that has taken its time getting into your brain finds a vast network of nerve endings, it begins to rapidly reproduce, starting at the base of your brain where your pons is located. This is the part of the brain that controls communication between the rest of the brain and body, as well as sleep cycles. Next you become anxious, you think you only have a mild fever, but suddenly you find yourself becoming scared, even horrified, and it doesn't occur to you that you don't know why. This is because the rabies is chewing up your amygdala. As your cerebellum becomes hot with the virus, you begin to lose muscle coordination and balance. You think maybe it's a good idea to go to the doctor now, but assuming a doctor is smart enough to even run the test necessary in the few days you have left on the planet, odds are they'll only be able to tell your loved ones what you died of later. You're twitchy, shaking and scared. You have the normal fear of not knowing what's going on, but with the virus really fucking the amygdala, this is amplified a hundredfold. It's around this time the hydrophobia starts. You're horribly thirsty, you just want water but you can't drink. Every time you do, your throat clamps shut and you vomit. This has become a legitimate, active fear of water. You're thirsty but looking at a glass of water begins to make you gag and shy back in fear. The contradiction is hard for your hot brain to see at this point. By now, the doctors will have put you on IVs to keep you hydrated but even that's futile, you were dead the second you had a headache. You begin hearing things, or not hearing at all, as your thalamus goes. You taste sounds, you see smells, everything starts feeling like the most horrifying acid trip anyone has ever been on. With your hippocampus long under attack, you're having trouble remembering things, especially family. You're alone, hallucinating, thirsty, confused and absolutely, undeniably terrified. Everything scares the literal shit out of you at this point. These strange people in lab coats, these strange people standing around your bed crying, who keep trying to get you to drink something and crying. And it's only been about a week since that little headache that you've completely forgotten. Time means nothing to you anymore. Funnily enough, you now know how the bat felt when he bit you. Eventually, you slip into the dumb rabies phase. Your brain has started the process of shutting down. Too much of it has been turned to liquid virus. Your face droops, you drool, you're all but unaware of what's around you. A sudden noise or light might startle you, but for the most part, it's all you can do just to stare at the ground. You haven't really slept for about 72 hours. Then you die. Always, you die. There's not one thing anyone can do for you. Then there's the question of what to do with your corpse. I mean, sure, burying it is the right thing to do, but the virus can survive in a corpse for years. You could kill every rabid animal on the planet today, and if two years from now some moist, preserved, rotten hunk of used-to-be brain gets eaten by an animal, it starts all over. If that doesn't horrify you enough, I'll leave a couple of links in the description showing the deterioration of rabies patients, but I will warn you, it's really not easy to watch. Vaccines are very effective, and if you're aware of being bitten by a potentially rabid animal, treatment before symptoms show can also be very effective. 
that once symptoms start to show, it's almost certain that you'll die. So it's definitely a mystery in itself how to even treat the disease once symptoms start to show. But I wanted to finish the video on a more positive note and tell the story of how one woman survived. On the 4th of September 2004, 15 year old Gianna Gies was bitten by a rabid bat that she tried to rescue. Her mother washed her wound but didn't know that she needed to be vaccinated, so about a month later she started experiencing symptoms. An infectious disease specialist at the hospital theorised that if Gianna's immune system was given enough time before rabies reached her brain, she would be able to fight it off. So they basically put her in a coma and gave her a cocktail of antiviral drugs. Tests showed that her body was producing antibodies and she was taken out of the coma. This process was named the Milwaukee Protocol and has since been used for a number of patients who were infected with rabies. Gianna was placed in rehabilitation to relearn how to walk and talk. She still suffers some problems with running and balance and speaking a little bit slower than she used to before, but for the most part she leads a mostly normal life. Gianna is the only person I could find that has definitely survived rabies with no treatment prior to symptoms showing. Though don't quote me on that as some sources state that she was the only one and others state that there was between 8 and 10 people. Some reports of other survivors are pretty misleading. For example, one boy was given treatment before symptoms started to show, though he still experienced symptoms but ended up surviving anyway. And a couple of other survivors were reported at the time who actually ended up dying from rabies at a later date. So how exactly did Gianna survive? You might think it was thanks to the Milwaukee Protocol, and maybe it did help in her specific situation, though a study has since shown that it did not increase survival rates in subsequent cases. One possibility to explain this miracle is that Gianna might have had some kind of genetic immunity. According to Wired.com, Amy Gilbert of the US Centers for Disease and Prevention tested 36 people for antibodies against rabies and seven of them came back positive, despite only one of them receiving a vaccination, suggesting that the others had been exposed to rabies but hadn't died from it. It's possible that these people may have somehow had genetic immunity and that could explain how Gianna survived, though it's impossible to know whether she would have survived had she not been put into a coma. Considering the bat that bit Gianna was never recovered or never examined, it couldn't be determined whether that bat may have been infected with a weaker strain of rabies which could have possibly explained Gianna's survival. Really, it's impossible to know how many people might have survived the disease. I mean, there could be hundreds and thousands and maybe millions of people that have been bitten by a rabid animal but never experienced any symptoms and therefore were never tested. Either way, even one person confirmed to have survived is good news and a step in the right direction. Hopefully it's only a matter of time until we develop better treatments for people after the onset of symptoms. So that's it for today's mysteries. Despite some pretty sad stuff, I did find it really fascinating to research for this, so I hope you enjoyed it as well. And if you did, please consider liking and subscribing, and leave your theories and any other medical mysteries you can think of in the comments. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next Thursday in a new video.